Cool. And then I'm going to mute my mic and turn off my camera and Mickey, the show is yours. All right. So thank you guys for coming back. It's like I was saying a minute ago, it's awesome to see so many names that have kind of come along with me on this little journey and it's super fun. Um, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen, but today I really want you guys to be getting involved. Um, I feel like I love going to seminars. I love teaching at seminars because I get to engage more and I get to, um, and when somebody's up there speaking, I feel like I have the opportunity to be able to um, really, I don't know, it's just different. You feel like you're learning, you're a part of something. Webinars are awesome and I love them too, but there's something about being in person. So I thought I wanted to kind of switch things up just a smidge today and try to give it more of like a seminar type feel rather, rather than me just kind of talking at you. So um, first and foremost, hopefully, uh, it looks like you guys are all seeing Kristen still. Let me see if I, am I up on your screen? Can anybody give me like a thumbs up or something? I've got you on my Yeah, screen. you got me? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so there it goes. Um, it says I can't share my screen, Kristen. All right, so let me give her a minute to switch that over and then I'll just talk about myself. Hi. Uh, so I'm Mickey with Mickey Woods Marketing and originally I owned my own shop and I did that for a little over four years. The recession had hit and so I really struggled to hang on and my Biggest thing that we're going to talk about today, why I really understand where you guys are coming from, is when that recession hit and when I had a lot less vehicles coming in the shop, um, it was a tricky time. Plus, I had Fix, who was really ramping up at the time, and they had brought on a shop down the way. So now, all these insurance companies that A, I had contracts with, or B, was trying to get new work on and become signed on as a DRP. Uh, I was really struggling because these, the fix guys just rolled in and they just got them. And I, of course, was pissed because I had been working a long time to try to get these contracts and um, they just waltzed right in. So I get it where you guys are coming from. We're trying to uh, right now just make the best of what we've got, but it's difficult. A, with we got coronavirus and then B, we've got these consolidators, right? So here's a picture of my shop and it's so funny. It's been so long since I've seen a picture of my shop. Um, when I looked at it just over the weekend, I was kind of putting this together. I was like, wow, it really just looks like a box of bricks. But you know, when it's your shop, you love that thing. It's your baby. It's a piece of you. And, um, and you know, I just really loved having my shop. I loved everything about it. And as you can see there, I had seven lines of vehicles. I work with Casa de Cadillac uh, dealership and they had all these lines that they, that they were selling. And I was the body shop for all of them, plus some insurance companies. Um, now during the recession, they decided to go open up their own shop. So that pulled a lot of my work. Plus, like I was saying, then we had Fix who had opened up and they were getting a lot of DRP work. And then on top of it, Caliber was sniffing around. So it was really a time of survival and what am I going to do to just keep my doors open and be paying my guys, be paying my staff. It was stressful. It was hard. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot. So all those dealership contracts, even though I was their shop, I was literally, so Casa de Cadillac, I was Casa Automotive Group Body Shop. Even though I was their shop, there was no certifications back then, I had to fight to get those riders to be sending me work. So we're going to talk a lot about the relationship and how important that is in marketing your shops. So then after, um, unfortunately, I had to let my shop go because with the recession and the MSOs coming, there were just so many different things going on. I ended up going and working full time for Valley Motor Center Auto Body in Van Nuys. Um, and for them, I got to, instead of wearing 15 bazillion hats that you wear as an owner, I was able to just wear a marketing, sales, advertising hat, mainly marketing. Um, so then I was able to do a lot of events, focus on the website and social media, branding, uh, working with agents, trying to, be, trying to help them bring in new insurance contracts and all that kind of fun stuff. And then after working for Valley Motor Center about five years, the owner, Marge, passed away and then I decided to go independent. 
So when I went independent, I was able to work with shops all across the country, uh, which is what I've been doing since. And it's been amazing. And then about a year and a half ago, I started writing for Body Shop Business Magazine. So this has been such a fun thing to do. And I think actually somebody from Body Shop Business Magazine on the line today, um, I let him know I was doing a webinar. This has just been such a blessing and I'm so excited to be able to do this. This was the March 2019 cover story, I believe, which was competing against the big boys. How to thrive in a consolidating marketplace. So um, <laughs> this was a great article. I loved it and I love to write about it because it's something we are all struggling with. To in one way, shape or form, the consolidators are here and they're not going anywhere and they just keep eating up market share. So we're, I'm going to share some of the things that I talked about in this article and really kind of go into in depth on them today. So today's title is battling the big boys, setting yourself apart with relationship marketing. So like I said, today, I really want today's webinar to be about you guys participating and being involved. And I know like being in actual seminars, <laughs> sometimes the speaker will get up and say, okay, so I want your, everybody to participate. And your first reaction is like, oh, goody. <laughs> but then at the end of it, you're like, that was one of the best freaking seminars I went to. So I really hope it's something like that for you today. I really would like some participation from you guys. I recommend taking notes or you can watch the playback, but I really want you to take some of these things that we're going to talk about and start to put them in place in your shops and um, whatever, however that fits with you. So right out of the gate, I'm just going to ask you guys if you can put in the chat box and um, I'll pull up the chat when we start chatting or maybe I can't, I don't know, we'll see. If not, then Kristen can read them. But I'd like for you guys to put in the chat, what do you guys think the MSOs and the consolidators are doing really well? We know they do, we all do some things really great and some things not so great. For the consolidators and the MSOs, what are they doing really well that you can just see? Anything. Come on, give it to me, guys. How many people we got on this call right now? Oh, 46 people you're trying to tell me nobody has anything to say. All right, we've got uh, cornering DRP agreements for favorable assignment. Absolutely, 100%. Anybody else? Social media presence. Yeah, they are able to put out a lot of social media presence. They've got a fleet of people, so it makes sense that they're able to constantly be putting stuff out. Branding, for sure. Branding is a great one, which is super important for them since they're everywhere. Instant customer response. Interesting. Anybody else have anything to say? Cultivating their own workforce. Yeah, I love that. Um, Caliber, just like a lot of the MSOs out there and a lot of the consolidators, I love how um, they really bring people from the bottom up. They do a great job with that. Bravo to them. Okay, so let's talk about it. Let me share my screen on this side. And let's talk about some of the things I had kind of jotted down. So here's some of my things. Uh, they have buying power, kind of like what, what we talked about. Got a lot of buying power to be able to get insurance contracts, to get dealership contracts. They're massive. If they, they have buying power that most of us will never be able to achieve. It's just as simple as that. They're able to get large discounts because of that large buying power. They can provide fairly robust insurance plans for their employees. So a lot of us smaller shops just don't have a pocketbook to be able to roll out these big insurance plans like some of these other big guys. They allow for extra days off for employees. So in a small shop, I know when I was running my shop, God forbid I take a day off because it was you don't know what kind of hell you're coming back. Oftentimes when you're with one of the consolidators, um, I know a lot of people that are work with, with consolidators and they'll leave for two solid weeks. I will tell you when I owned my shop and even just working as a manager in a shop, 
I never got more than a few days off. Two weeks straight, Puh, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, and then like we talked about, upward movement. They're able to move upward. Um, now let's talk about the, what they're not doing well. So can you guys share with me what you don't think they're doing well? And this is gonna be really important because what most consolidators are not doing well, the independents can take advantage of because we're small. So let's take a look and see what you guys think about what they're not doing well. And I know that you have a lot of things you don't think they're doing well. So go ahead and share them. What you got for me? Repair quality, consistency. For sure, I hear this kind of stuff all the time. Quality control, customer education, yep. Protecting consumers, definitely. Customer experience, yeah. They're not making money well. Don't let them hear you say that. <laughs> OEM procedures, that's an awesome one. And think about that one, but you're right. Yeah, these are awesome, you guys. Thank you for participating with this. You're right, and it's easy for us to kind of see what they're doing and identify what they're not doing very well because we think, God, if I was that big, I would do, da, 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 da. <laughs> you know? Um, demanding big discounts and delaying payment. I, um, I've dealt with that to some degree with my dealerships. So I have an interesting perspective because I get to work not, excuse me, not only with my shops, with people like you guys out there, um, but I also work with the community. I work with agents. I work with dealerships. I work with the OEs. I work with everybody on all different ends of this body shop process. So I get to hear all kinds of different things. And I'm friends with people in all the different areas. So I'm not talking about right. consolid consolidators. Like there's some bad, terrible thing. There's a lot of great things about them. Kudos to them. They're, they keep thriving and they keep doing well. Kudos to them. Um, but as independents, there are a lot of things that big guys just can't do. Uh, and then I think we had one more, which was no decision, no, oh, no decision making maker re relationship with the partners. So let's let's go back and chit chat about what I had on here. So the biggest complaints and weaknesses that I'm hearing on my side um, are kind of twofold with dealers. Kind of again, what we were just kind of talking about. Uh, my dealers are saying that they're over promising. Now, because they have so many shops, they can push, they can promise bulk, which the dealerships love because for them, it's like, ooh, numbers. You can push all these people over for service and it'll increase my service numbers and then you'll be buying all of these parts. So my, on the dealer side, we've got some over-promising that's not coming through. And then on the consumer side, Mainly across the board, we have a lack of quality. Those are the biggest complaints. Um, not that they're not doing other things well, like we just talked about, but these are the biggest ones that I hear. Then we've got the main issue. So the main issue is they can't connect. And what I think that the, the last comment I read kind of was speaking on is they can't connect on the same level that independents can connect on which of course they can't, they're, they're huge, they're, they're massive. The, the level of what they got going on is completely different than what we've got going on. So there are four main relations, oh, and I got, sorry, I got more on this. Um, they can't, basically they can't create the same level of relationships, like I was just saying, that with their customers, their partners, dealers and agents, uh, or their perspectives, which would be the community. So there are four main relationship steps where I think there's a breakdown occurring for MSOs and consolidators. And again, it revolves around relationships, relationships, relationships. So we're gonna talk a little bit about those different steps. So uh, relationship step number one is slow down and win over your customer. The customer is the first relationship step. It's just like a chain of anything. Um, you know how it is in your own town when you have your favorite restaurant that you like to go to and all of a sudden they get bought out by like a Chili's or 
something like that, it just changes. It's different. What did you used to get before when it was independently owned? When it was a small kind of mom and pop deal, it was totally different. You got individualized attention. You felt special. Uh, there weren't a lot of problems falling through the cracks because the owners were super involved. When you're dealing with corporations and MSOs, things like that, consolidators, they don't have the opportunity to have the big money where the boots are on the ground. So the responsibility and the people who are caring the most because they're watching the financials are in an office way somewhere else. They are not the boots on the ground. So oftentimes when we're talking about um, these consolidators, they, and, and customers, they're oftentimes feeling processed because these consolidators have very strict rules and SOPs that they have to follow. Understandably so. So another portion that I wanted you guys to kind of chime in on is when it comes to your customer, because this is going to be a number one important connecting with your customer, how are you guys how do you feel like you're winning over your customer? What are you doing? And this again is gonna be a great help to other people on the call. What are you doing to win over your customer? Um, if you guys can share in the chat box, I'll read some of these if you could pop some of those up. So while I'm waiting, since you all are, y'all are being shy today, it's cause it's Monday morning, I know it. Um, Educational interactions, awesome. Educating your customer, helping them understand the process, the repairs, for sure. And that goes back to feeling processed. If our guests are feeling processed, they're not feeling connected to. If we're walking them through things and talking them through it, it really helps to make the connection that we care. And that's so, so, so important. Um, Awesome. So from Gus, we hold their hands, listen to their needs. <sighs> Amazing. Uh, especially in what, in light of what we have going on right now, people are super like needy. They're, they're much more sensitive. Everybody's emotions are raw right now. And if we can hold people's hands and listen to their concerns right out of the gate, they know that they're not just coming to a place that wants to take their money and kind of just okay, great, I'll call you when it's done, bye, and on to the next one. Uh, we really care about them. And that will go, that, that customer relationship, again, it's building a relationship, will go deeper. And we talked about like devotion and loyalty on another one of my webinars. This is huge for that. Um, let's see, transparency. Awesome. I love transparency and I love just being honest about what you got going on, if you've got a little hiccup in the shop and things slow down, um, I think with transparency comes communication. And with our smaller shops, we have the opportunity to be able to just be communicating, communicating, communicating. <laughs> totally different than some of the bigger guys. Um, John, educating consumers on the importance of OEM-driven repairs using OEM manuals. Thank you for this. So this goes back to another one of our webinars. We talk about informing our customers, informing our guests, keeping them in the loop, not just talking at them, but communicating with them. And these are a lot of the ideas that I had written down, communicating more and during each step. So it's not just they're getting the text update, you're actually reaching out to them more, communicating with them more, going back to um, you know, the, I love the, how we hold their hands, listen to their needs. That's such a powerful statement. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one way we can also do this is bringing some of your employees from the back up to the front to give that um, feeling. We talked about it before for doing it for a different purpose. And that's making your techs and painters in the back letting them have a relationship and having some ownership, knowing that this isn't just me banging on a sheet of metal all day. This is a car for a person and they create, and it creates this responsibility in the repair and it puts us all on the same team. But um, man, what if your customer met the guy, if he's raving about a paint job, what if the painter rolled up and was like, I just want you to know this, the hue on this vehicle is gorgeous. I love painting it. 
and wanted to come out and meet you and just tell you how beautiful your car was. Ha, ha, tell me a consolidator that does that. Not many. Um, making sure that we're calling, <laughs> that we're calling when the vehicle is done. This is huge for our customers. I, there's a lot of people who are, um, a lot of shops that are calling when their vehicle is not completely repaired yet. Huge, don't call them until the vehicle's been QC'd and done done. Um, Bob, as a supplier, sharing the ups and downs, True Alliance, for sure. Um, you know, oftentimes we think that if we are being candid with somebody and sharing sometimes where we've failed or not done so well, that it makes us look weak. And for example, when I used to share my story about owning a shop, I glossed over the fact that the recession hit and I lost it and I wasn't able to keep it. I just kind of would go into, I owned a shop, but now I'm here because it was a struggle that I went through and I felt like it made me seem weak or something like that. And you know, once you kind of get past that and you realize that people truly, they get it, we get it. And it allows that relationship, some, the honesty of, Hey, I appreciate you just being straight with me. And as independents, we can take that time and we can be really real and heartfelt because it's our shop. Even if you're a manager of a shop or you're like, like Bob, a supplier, being able to be transparent, it's so huge. And that's how relationships are built on all levels. You know, we're talking business to consumer, but friendships, you know, relationship, guy, girl, girl, guy, whatever. Um, this is the basis of relationships and having a strong relationship with your customer is something that our consolidators are just not able to do to the same level that we can do it at. Not that they can't do it at all because they're still human beings and there are a lot of great, great people that work for these consolidators. So I'm not saying that by any means. I'm just saying we have the opportunity to take it a whole step deeper, right? Okay, so I think I got everybody's things on there. So let me just switch back real quickly. So relationship step number one, slow down and win over your customer. That's gonna be our first and foremost relationship step. Relationship step number two is it goes with the customer, but it's delivering the best quality because without providing good quality, what kind of relationship can you deliver? Right? Think about it. Uh, let's have a relationship, but I'm going to just call you rarely if some, you know, it's, if we were friends and I'm going to barely ever call you, maybe if something comes up, but you're not going to develop a friendship with somebody you don't really know if you don't really spend the time with them and that you're not providing them with some quality friend time, right? So if we're looking at this in regards to your business and we're delivering quality, we can't build a relationship with somebody when we're giving them hunks of junk back and we're not doing the job the way we should be doing it. And if we think about it, when most ideal, let me back up. I, Part of what I do and what I've done for a very long time is I deal with CSI and I deal with, <laughs> I'm the lucky one that gets to deal with unhappy customers and unhappy dealers and unhappy agents or whoever's unhappy. It's usually me because I've built the relationship. But oftentimes, always, typically, a customer, a whoever you're fixing the vehicle for they would rather wait longer to get their vehicle back properly. Your dealership, your customer, take your time, fix it right. Don't call me because you're trying to rush it through to get my car back quickly. Get it done. Take the time. There are a lot of Yelp reviews that I read for my clients and Google reviews. Took a little bit longer than expected. Worth the wait, 100%. We've got the time and there's no reason why we should not be spending the time to providing the best quality. Um, so let me ask you, so back to our little chat again, what steps has your shop put into place to help improve your QC? 
What are you guys doing to improve your quality control process? Because this is huge because again, we're talking about places, there are a lot of things that consolidators do really great at and there are when we just can't touch it. Like I was talking about buying power being a number one, but there are places where the consolidators are really weak not terrible all the time, but they're weak and we have the opportunity to be stronger. And this is one huge, huge thing. So when it comes to quality, which is part of the relationship, what are you guys doing to be able to improve the quality that your shop's putting out? I will tell you again, when it goes back to reviews um, and looking at reviews and hearing people talk about um, calibers is like we talked about before. It's the quality of the stuff that's coming out. They're busy, they're pumping things through. And if the quality is not that great, I think they're just rolling it anyway and just closing their eyes and holding their breath. So what's something that you guys are doing for quality control? You've gotta be doing something. Please tell me you're doing something. Quality control, what are you doing? What steps have you, has your shop put into place? Now I know my busier shops, all right, you guys aren't gonna talk. That's fine, I'll keep talking. Um, when you have a busier shop, your quality control is going to suffer to some degree. It's almost like having a little leak in a pipe. And if you're just running a little bit of water through that pipe, you don't really know that there's a leak or it's some little pinpoint leak and it just really is nothing. When you start pushing water, more water and turning up the water, all of a sudden that small little pinpoint leak is now spraying. So the issue that you had before is now magnified. And that's one thing with um, QC that we, I often see is when my shops are slower, they're doing great. But the second they start picking up, holy quality control issues, right? Um, so in process, QC is required. You can't wait till delivery is what Kristen shared. I totally agree with this. Because if you think about it, we're waiting till delivery. Um, and there are a lot of shops that I see do this. They wait till the vehicle's done. And then the rider will go out. They're like, oh, car's done, call the customer. The rider happens to pass by it on his way to the, the back lot or whatever. And all of a sudden they're like, oh crap. Somebody's, you know, Mr. Smith is coming to pick that car up today. I can totally see that this vehicle, you know, the, the fender or whatever was not blended properly. This thing's gotta go back in the paint that they not, oh my God. Or your QC guy, he just looks at it at the end. There's no QC going through the process to stop something when a problem happens right away. Big, big problem. So who's gonna be in charge of that? You've gotta decide in your shop. Is it your production manager? I feel like our tech should have their own quality control that they, oh, they should be doing, but don't get me started on that. Um, but yes, definitely there needs to be quality control going through every level. Anybody else have anything they wanted to share? Now, one thing that, well, I'm waiting, um, I'll keep talking, uh, that the consolidators are doing is oftentimes they are sending out uh, because of typically like insurance contracts or whatever, their customers are getting some type of follow-up email and things like that. Like we talked about before, you guys are just gonna have to watch all my last webinars because we got so much good stuff. <laughs> I wish I could just fit it all into one. But one thing we talked more about that I'll just touch on briefly is uh, having a way to follow up after the repair because sometimes you don't know somebody's not happy but they leave anyway. Um, and it happens way more often. What was that slide that I was showing? Um, I think it was like one in 26 people complain in person. It's when they leave that they're upset and they don't tell anybody. So how are we following up with those people? That's gonna be big quality control. Um, and, they, and I think Caliber, those kinds of guys are doing those types of things, but how much of it are they doing? Are they following up on it? Uh, I recommend, since you all aren't gonna share, I'm gonna, Tell you my recommendations for quality control i do recommend that somebody be a qc person i do think qc should be is necessary throughout the process and that qc person should be following the vehicles and going into the different departments and working closely with your production manager on these issues and then also at the end of the vehicle they are looking it over with a fine tooth comb after each process and depending on the size of your shop this is going to have to look have different versions of how this looks but uh, something like that 
because quality is the biggest issue that customers have with these consolidators. So it's something that y'all are being quiet on, but it's something that you really need to be thinking on and you should probably be writing down notes. However you're doing it, it could always be done better. It can always be done better. Your, your reviews on your Yelps and your Googles are typically gonna be negative because of your quality, right? So um, anyway, Go ahead, keep being shy, that's fine. So let's talk about the next relationship step. And that brings us into, uh, from quality, we go into relationship step number three. And that's gonna be connecting with your partners regularly and letting them know that you appreciate them. This is big, 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 big. Now, when I say partners, I'm talking about everything from your dealership, your agents? Are you in a BNI or networking group? What are you doing with your partners? You know, a lot of shops are either dealership or DRP centered, uh, sometimes a mix of both. But uh, as we know from before, when we did a statistics, most shops, most people on this call, you guys are not sourcing your customers, meaning you're not asking where they came from. So it's important to develop a relationship from your big, with your biggest referrals sources, right? If you've, got a, if you've got a handful of people out there that are referring a ton of vehicles to your shop, you need to be focusing on those people to create those relationships. Super important, but how do you know who they are? Or sometimes you think they, you know who they are, but do you? Chris and I were joking around before, you don't know what you don't know, seriously. Seriously, if you can find a way to source and drill down when a customer comes in, when a guest comes in to find out where they're coming from. So a lot of reasons why this is gonna be great, but this is gonna really help you, this relationship step, because people like to feel appreciated. So if you guys wanna stop being shy now, you can share in your chat box of what you guys are doing to let your partners know that you appreciate them. What are you doing for your agents? What are you doing for your dealers? Anybody wanna share? Not filing suit? Okay, so if anybody else wants to share anything, feel free. I would love to hear what you guys are doing. And if you're not doing anything, then you definitely need to be taking notes because <laughs> you should be. Um, so when I worked at Valley Motor Center, we did something really cool there. Um, oh, good. We had somebody say something. Thank you, Vision Collision. We try to stop by, maybe drink, bring drinks, Gatorade in the summer, mostly stopping by, talking, thanking, appreciating. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. So some of you may have the resources to be able to do this more than others or do it more frequently than others, but it really just to do something is helpful and it makes them feel so good. We are in a partnership with these people, meaning it has to be going both ways. They are referring and sending you work because they appreciate you and you provide something great for them. What are you returning in that relationship? It can't be one-sided. Uh, let's see, Matthew, we used to have in the last few years deliver rum cakes every holiday season. Hello, yum. Uh, we stopped because it ended up being 50 plus cakes every year. Yeah, and it can get to be a little bit crazy. But I bet you that they remember when you used to bring those rum cakes. And I bet you they were stoked when you brought them because they love to freaking be fed. I'm telling you, I don't care who it is. When I walk in with food, I'm the most important person in that building. <laughs> That's what makes me so famous because I always bring food everywhere I go for people. They love it. That's great. Um, what I was going back to at Valley Motor Center, something that we used to do is we used to track the agents. So here's an interesting idea for you guys. So I think it was State Farm. When the State Farm assignment would come through, some of your assignments come through and they don't have your agent's name. And I don't know, I have to look, I don't know now if they still do or not, I'm assuming so. Um, but we would, I could get, anytime a State Farm assignment would come in, I'd print out a copy for myself. 
and I would look through and see all the agents on all the assignments. Now that guest got into an accident. Did they call their agent every time and the agent sent them over? No, they sure didn't. But I acted like they did. So what I would do is I would, I had a type note, pre-type note, like a template on my on, um, Word document, but I would go in and adjust the name, the vehicle, thank you for sending Mrs. Smith over with her Toyota Corolla. Um, she was recently in an accident because she was recently in an accident. I just want you to know that we're doing everything possible to make sure the process is smooth and you know just whatever whatever um thanks again mickey and the team at valley motor center and i would personally sign every letter like paper letter folks yes not an email paper letter and i did this once a week and i just do them in bulk and um you know, granted you know this was a this was a big shop so we were doing a lot and we were getting a lot of state farm assignments but I would send those letters out and you'd be shocked how well those went over. They loved getting them. They loved the appreciation. But here's the kicker. Most of them didn't even know that that client of theirs had been in an accident. So then I would follow up because I was also going out and visiting agents. I would go out and visit agents and I'd bring them like bagels or donuts or whatever. And just go by and say hi with notepads and cookies, whatever. And, um, and so then I'd go in, but I'd have my list of something that they had recently, that had recently been in the shop. Who knows if they were sent there by that agent? I don't know. And I'd walk in and say, hey, you know, and reintroduce myself like always, just in case they didn't remember me. And um, just say, you know, I hope you got my note. Just want to say thanks again for all your referrals. Now, this agent may not have been referring a single vehicle. I don't know. We really, it was, at that point in time, Valley Motor Center was not sourcing as well as it should have been. So I don't know exactly where these were coming from, but I'm, but I do know that every agent that I was visiting was not referring a bunch of work because they just, they don't all, and you've got the call center involved and all that kind of jazz. Um, but I would act like they did it and they were referring a lot and I was super appreciative of it. And they would leave and they were like, oh, wow. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Well. I'm going to do my best to keep referring over to you guys. Thank you. They felt really special. And guess what? The amount of referrals, the amount of state farm claims started going up when I started doing that. So it's incredible. So you don't always have to know where your work's coming from. If you know you're getting some work there, act like it's a lot because then you'll probably end up getting a lot. Um, and then the service writers, just like, who was it? Um, Vision, Vision Collision was talking about going out and visiting them. Uh, even if it's just stopping by to say hi, checking in, showing your face. And um, like I said, they love to be fed. Your partners love to be fed. <laughs> so when I do a dealership lunch, because at a dealership, um, especially right now with our certifications and everything are going on, if you do a luncheon for them because they've been referring or you just got started with them and it's kind of an introductory lunch and you have some of your if you have your, some of your employees from your shop go and you have a taco truck or an in and out truck or whatever it is you want to do, just to say, hey, thank you. Thank you. How far does that go? That's incredible. You are going to develop that relationship on such a deeper level. Now, not that the consolidators don't do that because I see... Um, I see some of the other consolidators when, where I'm like actually out and about, I physically see, and then I hear about some of the things that the other big guys are doing and they can do it to some level, but not to the same level as the independents can. Cause we're here and we're here every day and it's one-on-one -on -one and we, the level of, the level of you caring when it's your own shop, I'm sorry, you just can't beat it. Right. And then of course, making sure that you're bringing all your branding and branded materials and then, you know, like we talked about dropping off your cards when you're popping by with food for your dealerships or your agents, notepads, pens, all that kind of stuff. Just, hey, thanks for everything. Just thank you. At the dealerships, there are some writers that refer more work than others. And I act as if they all refer a ton because it helps the ones that aren't referring that much it gives them des the desire to want to refer more. It's, a, it's an interesting thing, this whole relationship marketing thing. 
but really it's making that genuine connection. You're genuinely appreciative of them, right? It goes so far. Um, and then making sure your employees feel appreciated goes a long way too. And I feel like that's, a, that's something for a whole nother webinar, but I did want to point it out. Uh, and then we've got another comment here, hats and t-shirts go a long way. Yeah, for sure. Apparel, which is interesting. Um, so a note on this. So as you guys know, I do a lot of, because it's local, Premier Coach, I do dealerships and a lot of their like outside relationship marketing that we're talking about. And so we had we had hats made. Well, guess what? All the porters at the dealership. I started passing them out to everybody at the dealership, and all the porters are walking around all these dealerships with Premier Coach hats. And eventually, management was like, "Okay, you know, we gotta kind of tamp down on this." So then the porter stopped wearing them for a while, and then a little time went by, and the next thing I know, whoop whoop, I just see them popping up again. So it's pretty funny. Uh, they do appreciate it. And um, so A, number one, they're appreciating it. And then number two, you're getting your name out there. You're marketing. It's branding, 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 branding. Um, and then let's go on to, if, unless anybody else has something they want to say, let's go on to relationship step number four. So number three was our partners. And then number four we're gonna talk about is showing that you care and you're a part of your community, getting involved. So I feel like this is kind of a four prong thing here. And one and two, our customers and our, um, our, our quality kind of go hand in hand. But then we've got our agents and dealers, those kinds of things. And then we've got our um, a community partners. And it's super important that we're showing that we care about our community and that we're getting involved. And again, this is something where um, the MSOs are out there and they're participating to some degree. I've seen them at dealerships holding luncheons on that side of things. And then I've seen them have different things out in the community, getting involved with schools, like some of the bigger schools in the areas and things like that. I'm always noticing, because I'm in marketing, I notice and I take pictures of all kinds of randomness. You can ask my family, I'm like, ooh, that's a cool sign, picture. Well, it's actually more like boop on my phone, picture. And um, so I feel like, you know, if you can be out there kind of seeing what are they doing, know whatever they're doing, you can take it to another level, right? Um, Okay, let's see. Troy says, I feel like these are me too items. These days, most people are doing these. You would think, you, you would think they are, but they're not. You may be in an area where there are people doing more of these things than others, but I will tell you there are most shops out there, not that they don't want to, but either A, they don't have the time, the finances, or they just don't even know where to begin. So they're actually not. Um, if you aren't doing it, then you're left out. Well, you actually get bumped to the top. So uh, if you're not doing it, then it is kind of an out of sight, out of mind thing, unless they're calling the claim centers, obviously, and then it's, then it's up to your Yelp or Google reviews to convert them typically. Um, however, when you walk in with cookies, someone has left muffins. So you're in obviously a much more Pot, well, you're in an area where there's a lot more competition and more people are doing these things. So like fix, there's a lot of shop fix shops that will go out and do like waters and cookies and stuff like that. So they do get stuff, but does that mean that you shouldn't be? Does that mean that you shouldn't be spending the extra time with these people? Um, it's not a me too. It's just forget them, focus on me, have a relationship with me and my shop because I care about you and you get to know them on that extra level, right? So when we're talking about getting involved in your community, uh, they're, like I said, the MSOs and the big guys, they're doing it, but they can only scratch the surface. So let's see if anybody has anything to say about um, how you guys are participating in, the, in your community right now, like schools uh, involved in, you know, events, big events, maybe like street fairs and that kind of stuff. Is anybody doing anything like that? Are you guys seeing good results with that? And again, this isn't because you wouldn't want to. Sometimes you just really didn't think about it that much. But these are all ways to develop the, the relationship component of this. 
pet marketing. I love it, Kristen. <laughs> Well, I know that when I am looking, so if you call me and you're like, Mickey, I really want to grow my involvement with my, um, with my shop in the community. I really want to start there. What we're going to talk about is we're going to have a laser like approach. I do not recommend, and if people are doing it, oh good, people are starting to put things on here. If you're doing it, it's not going to be, I'm not suggesting that it's um, just anything and everything, especially with shops that are bigger size and have bigger pocketbooks, I'm not recommending that you do it all. Don't do it all. Find your top one or two things in the community and do those and do those a ton. That's going to be where you get the biggest bang for your buck because it's top of mind, it's branding, it's staying consistent and in front of people versus doing a whole bunch of things. You're just kind of a spattering and you're pop up over here and then you later you may pop up over there. There's not that consistency. People aren't going to put the two together. I really recommend you be consistent with this. Um, okay. Kristen said dog walks, pet smart puppy training, show up and speak to dog safety and vehicles. Oh, I love that. That's one of those where I wish I would have come up with it. <gasps> so good. Um, let's see. We help the police association with a car show. Yeah, so we did that at Valley Motor Center. That was awesome. Cops and rotters, huge turnout. Yeah, the car shows are huge. So you can do, God, I wish I would have um, had a picture to show you guys of um, a booth we used to do at Valley Motor Center. And dang, the turnout for those car shows can be insane, especially when they're put together with a police association and that kind of stuff. So awesome. Thank you, Oscar. Um, TJ7504, supporting local vocational school activities, that's awesome too, because then you're also able to be marketing. Um, we've got another one, seeing a lot of shops being involved or sponsoring kids sports, little league, softball, soccer. Yeah, so that's kind of what I'm thinking also. There's a lot of sporting events that go on um, and a lot of schools. There's a lot, a lot of opportunity. And again, it's, you kind of got to pick where you think you can do a lot, where you can just kind of go ham. You start out with a couple things and you eventually ramp up. So um, at Valley Motor Center, there were two Chamber of Commerces in the area. There was the Chamber of Commerce of um, Sherman Oaks, brain fart, and then of Encino. So they both were local to Valley Motor Center. So I started attending both just to kind of try them out and test the waters um, for both of them. And the Sherman Oaks Chamber of Commerce ended up be, being the one where I really felt like I connected with people. People seem to be more interested. You know, you just, it's a vibe, you know, it's a vibe thing, right? So you've got to figure out where you're kind of jiving with people. Well, it felt like it was the Sherman Oaks Chamber. So we kept uh, our sponsorship or our um, participation with the Encino in terms of um, actually being like a member, but not participating a ton. But the Sherman Oaks Chamber, then I started going to a lunch. Actually, let me show you a picture. So when I talk about getting involved with something, like get involved. If you're going to do it, be committed. Do something. If it's a chamber, go every month. Before I show you a picture, let me just read these. Um, there's one more that I really liked here from, to, from Bob. Um, be at every career fair, high school and college. Again, it's going to be uh, how many... Your staffing, what it looks like, what you can get out to and what you can do. But I love this. So a career fair, you're not only participating in the community, but you're also marketing your shop. This is actually a great one trying to get some employees for your shop, especially with the shift we've got going on with employment right now. And you, you all know what I'm talking about on that. So let me just show you a quick picture. Valley Motor Center, we did, um, oh, well, actually, I'm going to show you this one first. At this is one of the sporting events, like somebody was talking about sporting events. So this is a picture, like I was telling you guys, I'm always taking pictures. <laughs> so this was uh, my son's baseball field. And I saw that um, the Caliber locally had partnered up with the state farm agent and did a banner. And I was like, oh, a banner, okay. Caliber, throwing something out there. But what else are they doing? They just don't have the boots on the ground Kudos to them for partnering up with a state farm agent. A, super smart marketing because that agent is going to be more boots on the ground because that's his business. 
Caliber, on the other hand, it's going to kind of get left at putting the banner up. They're not attending those games, chances are. The owner of Caliber is not attending that game. Maybe a manager or something, but again, it's just going to be different. Then when we talk about getting involved in chambers, so not like, hey, look at me. I just want you to show you when I became a member, well, when Valley Motor Center became a member of the Sherman Oaks Chamber, I went to one lunch every month. I was committed to going to one lunch every month, sometimes a breakfast also to mix it up. I sponsored um, a, and I say I, we, Valley Motor Center sponsored one luncheon every quarter in which I would get up and do a talk about whatever. Obviously, I try to make it automotive related um, and fun and whatever. And then also we participated in the Sherman Oaks Street Fair. If you guys are familiar with the Sherman Oaks Street Fair, it's like it was at the time like 80,000 people. Now it's up to like our last street fair was like 100,000 people attended. Crazy. But we did it every year for five years. So it was a big deal. And people knew they could find us there. And look at that branding on that booth. Hello. So... Uh, then they asked me to start emceeing events and speaking at all kinds of other other functions. But I wasn't Mickey. I was Mickey with Valley Motor Center. It, everybody knew me, Mickey Valley Motor Center, Mickey Valley Motor Center. They saw me, they thought Valley Motor Center. So think about it. If you're going to do like a chamber, if you're going to get involved with a school, pick a school or something that you've got around you that's local um, where you can be focused on and do it a lot there. Whatever you're going to do, dive in. So maybe that's, maybe you're an owner and your, your own child goes to a school. Well, start sponsoring events, start attending the events, wear your own shirt. It may seem silly, but go represent yourself. Show people that you're more than just, I'm here to take your money, that I'm part of this community. And we were talking, Chris and I were talking about it the other day. It's interesting right now with the whole COVID-19 thing going, how a lot of the big guys, their lots are a lot more quiet than some of the, some of my independent shops. Most of my independent shops are still kind of trucking along. Obviously we've had a dip in business, but why do you think that is? I think a lot of it, I know a lot of it is due to relationship marketing. Number one, with your dealers, with your agents, and then also with your community, and then you've got your past customers that have already come in that are devoted and they know you. If you've built that relationship, they're back. So this is huge, huge, right? This is a component that we really cannot be forgetting about in our business. And it's not, you know, this may not be the exciting, let's talk about proper estimate and the new ADAS tools and all this other kind of stuff and calibration that we need to do for the fun proper functioning of our business. But if we're talking about growth and sustainability for our body shops, this relationship topic is huge. And I hope today I gave you guys some things to think about. I hope I challenged you to maybe think outside the box, think of some other things that you can be doing um, in all different aspects. I appreciate you guys for participating with me and stepping out of the box a little bit. Um, again, I'm Mickey with Mickey Woods Marketing and my, my mantra is a goal without a plan is just a wish. So I have a lot of shops and a lot of clients who before they started working with me, it was a lot of talk. I want to do this. I want to do that. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I have this idea about doing that. Those are all just wishes. So everything that we're talking about today, if you're not doing them and you're just thinking about them, currently they're just a wish until we create a plan of action and a strategy to roll that stuff out for you to start getting that return on that investment. So if you need help with that in any way, please call me, um, message me. Here's my contact information. I'm on Facebook. LinkedIn. I have a YouTube channel that will have this replay, has all my other replays, some other videos. If you're interested in some other content, my website, you can always email me. I love to talk to my people. <laughs> so I appreciate you guys and your time today. I'll open it up right now for questions or comments, whatever you guys might want to share. Uh, I, I love, love, love all the comments. You guys have some great ideas. And Krista, I'm up. The puppy, but I mean, animals, anything with yeah. animals and babies, you already know. Well, the cool <laughs> thing is, is that, so 
you know, American values, I don't want to say American values change, but American values change, right? Let's make it political. No. Um, so 62% of American households have a pet and only about 34% have children these days. So having kids isn't necessarily, you, used to, you grew up, you got married, you bought a house, you had 2.5 kids and you, you know, um, it, that's different today. So pets have taken on a completely new role. Um, they are the number two reason for distracted driving accidents right behind. Um, really? So AAA has an entire website dedicated to pet distracted driving. Progressive used to have one too. Um, and then Progressive was, and I haven't researched in a while, but for a long time, Progressive was the only insurance company that offered injury coverage to pets if uh, they were injured in a car accident. So, so wow. um, pets, are, okay. pets are awesome. And there's, there's so many cool events, whether it's like a, a, you know, a dog walk, whether it's a 3K, 5K kind of dog walk or pets on parade or um, going to the, your pet smart for the puppy class. And, and what we used to do is we take a seat out of a minivan. So those Chrysler minivans, those captain's chairs were removable. Yeah. And they had wheels. <laughs> so we would yeah. we'd wheel them into a PetSmart and then we would sit there and do demonstrations on like a Saturday for how to install a pet seat belt for your dog. I love it. And then we would do it for the puppy class or whatever. But man, people just loved that. And it, and it had way more ROI than doing car seats. So a lot of people will do yeah. safety car seat inspections for babies. But well, if only 30 something percent of households have a kid these days. Um, pet marketing had a huge ROI. So, and it's fun. Who doesn't want to play with puppies? I mean, come on. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, well, and most people, they, may, they might not have human children. Yeah. They have animal children. <laughs> yeah. So it's and a, people it's, spend money on doing anything animal related. Yeah. Like, uh, we, there's a, a car star shop in, in uh, Chicago. So Jeannie Silver um, has a whole kind of little section of her lobby where she sells pet seat belts and leashes. And she has a little pet park area for the dogs oh, estimates and stuff and so um you know pet marketing has kind of been her thing but yeah a lot of a lot of great good stuff idea there. great idea well we have to go where the people are and that's kind of what we've been talking about is where are your people what are they doing what are they interested in if it's pets we need to be doing stuff with pets if it's you know certifications we need to be doing stuff with our dealers it's finding what where the hot spots are and that's where we market so I love that. Thank you for sharing all of that. Anytime you can get in on any sort of, whether it's the home and garden show or anything in your community and you can get a table, a lot of times you can buy, you know, you get a six foot table for 200 bucks, go. Um, yeah. I've stood at those with shops before and just people come up and ask questions. Um, and then mm -hmm. I've ran out in the parking lot and wrote estimates while people have shops. Yeah. You know, yeah. daisies and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah what kind of sure. track? yeah you know swing back by when you're done and i'll have your estimate ready but um yeah. you know <laughs> it, it, it works so <laughs> they haven't had time to come by they've been told to get an estimate or whatever and, and you happen to find them at some other event they've gone to on the weekend take advantage yeah. of it. yeah god bless cloud estimating and the ability to estimate from any you know device on the planet these days amen so awesome um well maybe another great presentation Thanks. Um, and some great feedback and participation. So yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, is this our last one? We have one more. Mm -hmm. I know it's almost over. Yeah. It can't uh, be over. <laughs> I know. I'm going to miss you. Uh, let's see. April twenty eighth. Um, we're going to talk about taking your mech, taking your taking your marketing to the next level. So, kind of, uh, where are you at now with your marketing? What can you be doing? Some people are at different levels. So how can we ramp that up a little? Yep. Awesome. That's where we'll get into. That's where you're going to cover like SEO and some other things, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Your SEO, your website performance. Is it doing well? Do you even know? All that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, we will see everybody uh, back for Mickey's next one. And then we are back tomorrow. This week starts to jam up. Um, it's like we kicked into hyperdrive. There are 13 total this week. We got two down. We'll have more to go. Um, we are busy tomorrow. We got uh, Sean Collins from 3M and Ian Shaw coming on talking about adhesives for modern inclusion repair. And then that's at 10 a.m. tomorrow, Central Time. Larry's going to be back on at 1 o'clock uh, with S the name, name, place, and emblems. And then at uh, that 4 or is it 3? 4 o'clock? 3, three, three o'clock. Uh, we've got uh, Carliner coming in talking about the importance of using correct fasteners and proper repairs. So a lot of stuff on riveting and other uh, fasteners for inclusion repair. 
Yeah, and I will tell you if you if you don't believe that a thirty dollar emblem just to replace a thirty dollar emblem can be a five hundred dollar estimate, well, don't miss Larry's presentation mm -hmm. at one o'clock tomorrow. So we'll all be on that one. Yeah, <laughs> when, when that man di um, digests or dissects the P pages and starts telling you what all's not included. Suddenly, that thirty dollar emblem becomes a five hundred dollar estimate, and you're like, wow. So um, busy day tomorrow. We'll make you thank you and we will see you soon. And we'll yes. see everyone tomorrow. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.